Good afternoon and welcome to another discussion with Diotima. And our Diotima for today is my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Dorothy G. Rogers of Montclair State University. I'm Mary Ellen White, one of the chief advisors to the Center for the Study of Women Philosophers and Scientists here at Paderborn University. And it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Dr. Dorothy Rogers. Dorothy Rogers is the chair of the Department of Religion at Montclair State University and is a philosopher by training. Uh, she teaches also in the Gender Studies program there. She received her master's and her doctorate from Boston University um, in Massachusetts and is the author and or editor of a number of works about American women philosophers, including America's first women philosophers, Transplanting Hegel. But that's not all. She's also subject editor of the section on fe feminists and abolitionists for the Dictionary of Early American Philosophers, which covers the range of 1620 to 1860. And in addition to that, she's written a chapter on one of her favorite philosophers, Marietta Kies, in Therese Boos Dykeman's Contributions by Women to 19th Century American Philosophy. Did you also co-edit that work? Yes, I did. Yes, Teresa and I collaborated on that project um, after working with each other on previous projects. And I was really pleased to bring Kai's delight in relation to the people that, um, that Teresa's worked on. Yeah. What brought you to philosophy? We have a lot of young students out there who are thinking about it as a discipline that's pretty worthless. Mm. What, bring, what brought you originally to philosophy? Right. Well, actually, it's interesting because I was from um, a non-college going family. I almost didn't go to college. Mm. And when I did get there, one of the first classes I had was classical philosophy. And I was really in love with the idea of going to college and studying, taking great literature, great philosophy, great other, you know, I barely knew what I was going to study. I just knew I was going to go mm -hmm. to college. And I actually, um, I will even name the, the advisor I had was Jerry Gill, very empowering, um, feminist minded uh, professor who really wanted to encourage students to explore their ideas. Uh -huh. And uh, he taught with a, sort of a group teaching method, a group discussion method, and I just found it absolutely intoxicating. And um, the philosophical school of thought that first really interested me was existentialism because yes. it, it just seems so vastly interesting and uh, focused on self-exploration and freedom and those were just intoxicating to me. So um, yeah, I decided to major in it at that time and um, then took some time out and studied religion at the master's level for a couple of years and then went back into a PhD program to revisit philosophy, go back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, when was it that you discovered women philosophers? Your publications seem to be mostly about women in the field of philosophy. How did that come about? Yes, indeed. And I had a friend in grad school who said, don't do this, you're going to ghettoize yourself. Ah. <laughs> Ghettoized. And I said, that's strong language. That's strong. That's very strong language. Um, I'm not sure it's a good reference anymore, but that's the word he used at the time. Um, I actually discovered women philosophers through your four-volume set. It was really interesting because I was working um, in the department at Boston University, and one of the professors asked me to help find a book that he'd seen on the shelf. He couldn't remember quite where described it physically as color blue, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I very eagerly went straight to the library and found it for him because it's, he said it had a woman philosopher in it. Mm -hmm. And I'd never even thought of or heard of women philosophers. So I, I took a look through it before I gave it to him. I think I might have actually taken one of the volumes for myself since it was four. I think he wanted the early modern and I took the 19th century volume to look at. and. Um, yeah, it was really, that was where, that was where, it was your, it was your set. And um, so after that, I didn't really do a lot with it yet. But um, when I was at my own stage of writing my dissertation, dissertation, I wanted to 
do um, a study of what women in political and social philosophy thought of the public-private distinction. And 19th century women believed in the public-private distinction. So I was going to stick with 19th century women. And my advisor had said, um, what you really need to do is find women who read Hegel because he dealt with it in a specific way. And we both kind of laughed like, yeah, we're going to find women who read Hegel. But he remembered a volume and, and put, it, put the book in my mailbox with a card that said, bingo, see page 236. <laughs> and that's how I discovered the women that I worked on. And so it was through my interest in learning what they thought about public, private, women, et cetera, that I got into my own sort of groove with doing this specific thing, which I'm, I'm thrilled that I, I sort of got it. Get it wise. I'm I'm really happy to be in this area of philosophy now. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Marietta Keys. Is it Keys yes. or Keys? Um, I thought for a long time it was pronounced Keys because I thought it was a German pronunciation, but it, the family pronounces it Keys. I, I actually f found a few of the family members when I was looking for archival sources on her. Yeah, Marietta Keys. Bring her to life for us. Yeah, I really, I really. Um, I think those of us who really get into certain areas of study just love and fall in love with what we do. And if others don't, then I guess I'm lucky that I, I have fallen in love with what I do. Um, Marietta Kies was uh, born halfway through the 19th century in uh, pretty much, it seems like, a working class farm family. And she went to, um, she was from the kind of family where she worked in the factories at age 10 and then started teaching at age 14. And once she got on the teaching track, she then went to college and continued on to graduate school. She's one of the first, uh, she's the seventh woman to get a PhD in philosophy in America. And in the US, I should say. Um, and she ended up writing a theory of altruism, which I think makes a lot of sense for a working class girl who had to work her way up um, because it sounds like her life was pretty impoverished. So she worked with um, thinkers like William Torrey Harris, who was about a generation older than she was. And he had started a Concord School, summer school of philosophy, um, similar to what we're doing now, right? Only in Concord, Massachusetts in the 1880s. And she attended that school while a professor at Mount Holyoke College, where she was teaching with her, you know, the level of education she had at the time. And then on, um, Harris's recommendation went to the University of Michigan, uh, where John Dewey was teaching a man named George Sylvester Morris, who uh, passed away young of an illness, and um, an economist, a political theorist named Henry Carter Adams. And it was through her who were these three, one an idealist, one a pragmatist, and one a socialist, that she developed this theory of altruism that um, that you know she only wrote two books and then she died of illness right in 1899 when she was in her mid-40s. So, but she's the one who I, I think um, has a lot to offer for political philosophy and whose life I find very inspiring. What does she have to say about altruism? Does she analyze what it is? Does, or does she merely recommend that we be altruistic? Or does she think it's a bad idea? And she thinks it's a great idea. And she actually says, that it's a, well, first of all, that the basic principle that should animate and um, be assured in our social and political life is justice, because that ensures we have individuality and freedom. So she establishes that as a baseline. I think she was very aware, and she was actually, because she talks about true socialism versus state socialism. So she was very aware of overarching principles of, of, of um, altruism or a society that might squelch the individual. She did not want that to happen. So her theory of altruism she developed by saying that um, it's appropriate for the state to establish systems and policies that make it more possible for people to be altruistic that because we're all assured with justice and individuality and freedom, we then can look at the relations we have to others in society and she hopes naturally feel an impulse to be altruistic, but the state should supply us with ways to, um, I think she does use the word enforce altruism, but she's thinking before 
there were any um, social safety nets. This is before we had a national income tax. This is before we had any food stamps or unemployment or social security or medical care. And um, her father, it seems, had been, um, like she grew up in extreme poverty and her father seems to have died young. Um, I have an ancestor who died in a poor house in the 1860s. It was a harsh time if you didn't have a social safety net or family with money. So she actually was part of the progressive movement who were, who were advocating for a way for society to build in safety nets and assure people a level of dignity in their lives. And she actually says that it's appropriate for the state to have policies and programs that will require the well-to-do to act as if they care about the poor. Okay. That becomes a little tricky because you don't want it to become a, a sort of big brother kind of looming over you trying to force you to be a nice guy. But um, she wanted to do it in a way that would ensure justice. So altruism, she said, is one principle of ethics and justice is the other principle of ethics that should work together. And um, I think she believed by doing that, she could ensure both the freedom for individuals to act altruistically naturally and a way for the state to provide that safety net that we don't, we didn't see back then. So, for example, let me ask you this hypothetical because it's far ahead of her time. If, for example, when I'm working on my income tax form as an American, and if I am one of the wealthy and I were to have given $500,000 to some hospital or some right. social services for the poor or, or a shelter for homeless women or something like that, and thereby receive a deep discount on my income taxes. Mm -hmm. Would she consider that altruism? And is that the type of federal policy she would advocate the government adopting in order to create a stream of revenue for the aid of those less well off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, I think she would approve of that possibility that you would have the right and, and um, ability to use your wealth well. She doesn't really talk about that as much as, she actually gives some examples like poor houses and uh, sanitation, uh, provision for sanitation and um, uh, services for children that she thinks that should be provided and it's strongly implied by the government. She doesn't say by the government, but strongly implied. So something that I should point out Yes, so I'll go back to that question. She does think, I think she would say that it's very lauded, laudable for people to give a lot of money to charity, mm -hmm. but it's not systematic. I see. We've had some instances in our own society where wealthy people have donated money to important causes, and that's, that's very, you know, admirable. But if you've had the environmental protection scraped clean and you have all of these programs gutted and then you have a few dozen thousand dollars donated but millions have been taken away it's not going to provide what the society should have as a as a um as a priority right okay. so one thing that she did say um she she was um somebody who had studied hegel and in his philosophy of right he actually expresses concern about if you provide too much uh, for the poor, you'll create a rabble. And you don't want to create a rabble because they will drag down, they will, they will lose initiative. It's the kind of arguments we make today. We don't want to create an underclass, right? It will, they will, will take away their initiative. They'll become dependent on the government. And she actually said in response to that, not verse, chapter and verse, she doesn't say, Hegel said this and I say that, but she did very explicitly in her section of addressing the same issues, she said um, that it would be irrational for the state to not care for all of its members. The state, the government should provide for all of its members. And you don't want charitable efforts to be um, arbitrary. You want them, you want it to be a rational system that people can depend on so you don't have a bunch of inequities to balance. 
So she would, she would say, oh, great for the person who donated hundreds of thousands to whatever cause. But let's make sure that our systems of governance have a structure in place so it's reliable for everybody. It's not a matter of, oh, is the rich man going to give to us this year, right? It's really a matter of, are we going to have an equitable society where we help to elevate those who are needy so they'll be equal with those who are well-to-do? So, and, and the other thing that I should mention is she has a lot of parallels to the ethic of care, who I, I think you and I have talked about this a bit before. Mm -hmm. um, so ethic of care theory talks about justice as kind of a bare principle of um, tit for tat, you get what you get, I get what I get, we just get what we deserve and stay out of each other's way. Um, and Kais talks about it in those terms. And for feminists, the ethic of care is a, another voice or a feminine voice, feminist voice, of concern and responsibility for the other. Mary Dekai says justice is the same thing, essentially, tit for tat, you get what you deserve, I get what I deserve, we leave each other alone. But then she says we need constructive laws to bring grace, an ethic of grace, which she admits is borrowed from the church, not that she wants people to be religious, but she wants an ethic of giving to in be infused into society. Um, and that ethic of grace is altruism. And altruism sets aside your own good, not total self-sacrifice, not self-destruction, but just sets aside your own good for the sake of helping others and getting the sense of the benefit for the whole. So, so we don't need to be martyrs, we, but we do have a duty to help those that swell off. Yes. Yes, and um, it's, it has a lot, she has a lot in common with the ethic of care on the ways in which she criticizes the principle of justice and the ethic of justice because she sees it as too bare and distanced from the needy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the big differences are that the feminist ethic of care sees it as a feminine relation and a way of um, interacting in terms of responsibility to other. She sees altruism as more of a principle of... Um, charitableness or um, empathy that you get similar to the, the principles of caring and, and grace in the, in the religious context. Um, she does make a clear distinction between church and state. She says they should stay separate, but they can both use both principles, ethics, um, justice, and grace. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, it's pretty nuanced when you get into it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, in part, she's responding to Hegel. Mm -hmm. What's Hegel doing in the U.S.? Oh, good one, right. That's where my, my book comes from. By the way, I'm revising that book, and the publisher and reviewers wisely pointed out that I hadn't included minority people in what the book. book. To the what book, was the book? The book was the one you, the America's First Woman Philosophers America. Transplanting Hegel. I'm revising to include more. Um, more elements of the movement, but also some voices of color. Okay. Because the, unfortunately, the original group I worked on had started, so this is where Hegel comes from. The original group I worked on was based in St. Louis, Missouri, which was a booming metropolis at the time because it was on the Mississippi River. And uh, then I, for about a decade, decade and a half, it was just flourishing there. And then people's jobs changed, their lives changed. Some went to Chicago, some went to Michigan, some went to New York, some went to Colorado. Uh, and it kind of spread in the various incarnations that those people took their Hegelian or idealist philosophical ideas. And so Kais had read Hegel as a part of that movement. She was in the younger generation and, um, and tapped into the uh, Neo-Hegelian Neo or idealist movement when it was in Concord, Massachusetts. Okay. The leader of the group in St. Louis, William Torrey Harris, was an East Coast guy and he went back home. So he settled in Concord near the Transcendentalist. Emerson was still alive. Uh, Amos Bronson Alcott was still alive. The memories of David, Henry David Thoreau and Margaret Fuller were still being revered. So they had this Concord school there. And that's where Marietta Kais encountered it. And their big thing in the whole idealist movement was to read Hegel, Fichte and Schelling to some degree, but to translate him, Hegel, and to, um, to import him and apply him to the American context. 
they really thought, and as, as uh, William Torrey Harris, the leader of the group, had said, we want to make Hegel speak English. So he really wanted, he just thought the system of German idealism, he just loved. He, he, Harris was extremely taken with it. And they used it primarily in education because actually Hegel did do his own philosophy of education, it's less known, but his Nuremberg lectures and had disciples who really promulgated his education theory. And um, then social and political issues, the pre-Civil War and post-Civil War discussions they were involved in, in and through their reading of Hegel and other German idealists, and uh, social issues in general. Most of the uh, idealist members of the idealist movement were very strongly supportive of the feminist movement. And they had very vocal feminists within their circle. So that's why Marietta Kies tapped into Hegel because she was mentored by this person in Concord School. And then when she went to Michigan, Hegel was still kind of all the rage in early philosophy before, um, before Harvard sort of brought, well, Royce is still an idealist, but um, before William James went to Harvard and before John Dewey used the term pragmatism, mm -hmm. um, Marietta Kies actually talked about her theory of the state being practical. And I, I really have to check to see if she was using that terminology in response to Dewey, or if they both anticipated it roughly at the same time, I'm not sure. Sometimes these expressions are just in the air and get latched onto by multiple philosophers simultaneously. Yeah, Speaking yeah. of multiple philosophers simultaneously, yes. tell us of some of the other women of the Hegelian American academy, so to speak, yeah. even though it wasn't a brick and mortar right. academy. Right, sort of a network <laughs> circle of people. Who else should we know about? Well, I think one of the, some of them were really um, educator, philosopher, feminist, or literary, um, literary and philosophical. Uh, Anna Brackett would be the educator feminist. Mm -hmm. um, Grace Bibb would be the literary feminist and a little bit philosophical. She did literary analyses um, of great works like uh, Macbeth from a feminist perspective. But then she married and kind of stopped writing theoretically. Um, Anna Brackett um, went back to New York and started her own school and didn't write very theoretically anymore. But one person who um, established herself as an educator and administrator very early and then blossomed as a, as a theoretical writer later in her career was Susan Elizabeth Blow. And I've never known if the family pronounces it Blow. I understand the writer Charles Blow pronounces it that way, the contemporary writer, or if it's Blau. But she was from an extremely prominent family in St. Louis. Her father was a U.S. senator. And he, um, in Missouri, Missouri was a slave state as defined then, but remained with the Union during the Civil War and was considered a border state. And her grandfather had been the owner of Dred Scott, Oh. So when the Dred Scott case came up, my understanding is the Blow family funded the lawsuit because they were opposed to slavery. They wanted to make the U.S. legal system respond to this grievous injustice, right? So they funded the case, and when it failed, her, her uncle Taylor Blow and her father um, Henry Blow funded the case, and then when it failed, they bought Dred Scott freedom for him. Uh -huh. So they made good. They were, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where you feel like, why didn't they just buy his freedom in the first place? But they wanted to force the legal system to recognize his freedom. And uh, Taylor Blow had bought other slaves and freed them. Not, not dozens, but definitely a half dozen or so are on record. Um, so she's from this very interesting, very powerful political family, and she was really well educated. She never married. She could never work for a career because that would have been a mark of shame to her rich father. Because in the 1870s and 80s, a young lady did not work for pay. So she discovered early childhood education when her family was traveling in Europe. She came back to study in New York under one of the experts of early childhood education, the new kindergarten theory. And she's the woman who was the first to successfully initiate and carry out a free public kindergarten program. Uh, they'd started one in Boston under Elizabeth Peabody. I want to give Elizabeth Peabody her due, but Boston wouldn't continue to fund it. 
I should also mention there was an African-American woman named Fanny Richards who started a kindergarten in Detroit around the same time. Some people have said she'd studied with Susan Blow, but she was the same age and she'd been teaching for eight years. I don't think she needed to study from Susan Blow. I think she discovered it independently, perhaps in Toronto, because she had family who had been associated with the Carey and Shad families in Toronto and Windsor, um, Canada, in um, Ontario. And I think she encountered it independently through those connections at the University of Toronto, which was open to women and people of color. Oh. So I just want to mention that because in my book I said, oh, she's the first, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And I never knew about this African-American woman at that time. And I searched high and low to see if she also wrote theoretical works, but she didn't. So, but I, I want to acknowledge that because the ways in which we segregate our knowledge, yes. both gender-wise and racially, I just think is a, it's just terrible. We, we don't learn from each other. So I, I do want to have Fanny Richards on record. So Susan Blow, though, after she did her kindergarten work as an administrator, and she volunteered for the St. Louis school system for 11 years, because, of course, she couldn't earn a living, uh, she then um, had some health problems, had a sister in upstate New York, and went to live in upstate New York to recover. And um, she was good friends with William Torrey Harris. They seemed to have a very you know, good collegial relationship. And he asked her what she was working on. She told him, oh, send me the manuscript. And he supposedly secretly published it for her. And she was a demure young woman, well, middle-aged woman at this point, but she claimed, oh, I never expected to be published, and I'm just not sure I'm worthy. And she was very, unfortunately, very good at either a false humility or a real sense of lack of entitlement intellectually. <laughs> And her book started selling. She became the expert. She published translations of Froebel. Friedrich Froebel was the kindergarten theorist out of Switzerland. Yes. And um, he was kind of a romantic and idealist mixed, and uh, in the philosophical sense. And um, so she did translations of his work, and then she started theorizing about his work. And she buried accounts and discussions of metaphysics, primarily metaphysics. There were two instances in which big long chapters of 30 to 60 pages are all Susan Blow talking about the dan danger of atomism, of pluralism, and that we need a monistic sense of unity to maintain our, our you know, cosmic realities as well as our society. And of course it applies to education because if you don't have a unified self and a system yes. through which the yes. self can learn, you'll have chaos. And, and she thought some of these psychological theories or evolutionary theories were too, um, kind of like just a, um, a random mish mishmash. She one time criticized a psychologist who gave children little packets of um, fragrances to smell to see what they could identify and see how well they were learning as kindergarten students. And she said they offend the poor, uh, you know, uh, what did she say? They, they offend the infantile nostrils with every stench under the sun. <laughs> you know, she's like, it's just, it just has no coherence. It has no reasoning behind it. It's just a barrage of experiments you're throwing at these poor children. They need to learn continuity and story and song and play, and they need to learn about the unity of the universe, right? So. Um, she had some really wonderful work. I'm not, myself, I'm not that much of a person who's into metaphysics. I feel like it kind of sometimes weds science and religion, and I'm like, do either science or do religion. But I'm thrilled that she did this exploration because it was really deeply meaningful to her too. So she's somebody that everybody should know if they are interested in early idealism in America. And if she'd been born two decades later, I think she would have been unstoppable because the opportunities were so confining yes. at that point in time. Um, then there is a second generation who are in Keyes, more in Merit Kaiser's generation, who ended up going into academia. And that's my next, that's volume two of the project I'm working on now. That's your next book. <laughs> yes. I, before we wrap up, I hope to uh, induce you to 
talk a little bit about the experience of this massive work that you have done with uh, Therese Booz Dykeman, mm -hmm. Therese Booz Dykeman, mm -hmm. um, to bring to us all of the philosophical and theoretical works of Catherine Esther Beecher, mm -hmm. the sister of um, Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin fame. Yes. And although she wrote much, much more than merely social, political, philosophical works, um, those works amount to six volumes. Yeah. We were going to have them on the table in front of us, but they would have blocked both of our faces. <laughs> so That's true. tell us Tell us about the, uh, a little bit about Beecher herself, mm -hmm. but about the experience that you personally had as a scholar working with another scholar to unearth these works, establish the texts, and bring them to the public. Yeah, yeah, that was a really great, um, I think probably discovering your book and then going to the conference in Amherst, Mass. in 97 when it was the 17th century women's conference on, on women in philosophy. That was uh, held by Eileen, the late Eileen O'Neill. Yes, Eileen O'Neill, yes. 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 She was a terrific person. And that, and then working with Therese Dykeman on the Catherine Beecher volumes were really kind of the pivotal moments that, that kind of solidified my commitment to this work and uh, was just really enriching and empowering, really. So what we did is we actually split up the works and she worked more on the philosophy of religion books, um, the common sense philosophy works. Uh, I worked more on the abolition and uh, women's rights works um, because Catherine Beecher, one, one area I love to study is um, women who, called, who said they weren't feminists in the 19th century. And as you know, Catherine Beecher wrote a petition saying, please don't give us the vote. It will, it will taint women's nature. It will oppress us. We don't want the vote. And she got something like eight or 10,000 signatures on it. And she collaborated with a friend of hers, Sarah Josepha Hale, who edited the biggest women's magazine, Ladies Godey's book. And um, I love the contradiction that Catherine Beecher presents because she was an extremely accomplished professional woman and she continually said women shouldn't be professional. Although if you look more deeply, her, her ideas, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because I did really focus on, in the six volume set, on the works where she discussed women. She really did have a sense that women's place was in the home, but it was an expansive version of home for her. Because if a woman really, say a, a woman in a farm, wanted to be a really good housewife. She would need, of course, child care. She would need housekeeping skills. She would need um, botany and gardening skills. She would need health and nutrition skills. She might need seamstressing skills. She might need, um, I said gardening, but that might include botany. If she needed to do animal care, she might need some level of veterinary skills. Um, she might need to know herbal medicines. Like there, are, if, if you a finance, you'd mentioned the other day, she might know how to do finances and she might need to have this management and business sense. So she really, I admire Beecher because she really wanted to, women to really be the um, mistress of their domain. And their domain in her view was expansive. And um, there would be no shortage of things to do or interesting things to do. And you could develop expertise in certain areas. You know, you could be, develop your expertise in crafts and then your neighbor could bring over the butter. You know, maybe she excelled in making butter. And by the way, my mom used to make butter. When I grew up on the farm, I cranked the butter in a butter churn. It was really, it was kind of a back to the earth thing, but it was fun and it was, it was real. She would sell the butter for money. Um, so I know what butter making is like. Um, so I love Catherine Beecher in that way. And then the other way I think she doesn't quite contradict herself is she had certain professions that were especially well suited for women. And you know, they were teaching, things like nursing, or she was okay with women doctors. She was okay with women missionaries, but not ministers. 
because they couldn't be in command over a man. And of course not the law, because that's a harsh, you know, rough and tumble profession that gets close to politics. But she saw those areas as especially well suited for women. And I think even um, the contradiction of her arguing about slavery publicly. She would only, as far as I know, only lecture two women about it and write for women about it. Of course, as you acknowledged the other day, men could pick up the book easily. But I think my understanding of her is that she also had the sense that it was perfectly appropriate for women to use their powers of moral persuasion. And if it was a social issue, that was an okay thing to do. Um, she, and I believe, I'm pretty sure she and Lydia Maria Child wrote a letter in opposition to the Indian removals very early on. Mm -hmm. And they addressed it to public officials. The Indian removals of known the, as the Trail of Tears when yes. various Indian nations were forced yes. westward overland right. from Florida all the way to the Mississippi. Right, during the reign of Andrew Jackson. And uh, I should say reign, listen to me. Reign, <laughs> during, yes. the, during the term, of, or terms, maybe he served two terms, of Andrew Jackson. Um, so, so she herself felt strong commitments about these, maybe she thought of them as social issues, not political issues, or maybe she thought because they were so deeply embedded in people's humanity that it was okay because it was a message from God, like God's morality was being violated. But at the same time, you know, in, in the session yesterday, you had, you had pointed out that some of her arguments were that, well, we can't quite know what's right in this case. And these, these slave owners might be moral people or they have a different understanding of the Bible. So I might be giving her a little more credit than is due there, but it seems to me that she, um, based on the work I did with Teresa and the works that I took over for the assignment that we gave me, um, that I think she had this nuanced view of women's role um, it's similar to a woman named Gail Hamilton who said it was because men and women tended to marry people, each other, when they had similar sympathies, similar political views, then women voting would only multiply the same vote. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't need to vote. Men could vote for them, she said. It, why try to convince them to give us the right to vote when we can just ask them to vote the way we want them to? So I think, I think Catherine Beecher, she to me represents this cohort of women in the 19th century. And I think we have our versions today oh, yes. um, of, of conservative feminists. They were arguing for women's rights from within their own political context. And it might be a context we don't agree with or we don't have sympathies with their political views, but they thought they were speaking on women's behalf and in women's best interest. So when it's 150 years ago, it's a little more benign than when you get angry when you watch the television. Yes. <laughs> but um, but I, I just find it fascinating. There's a whole cohort of them. Tell me, how did you and Dr. Dykeman come uh, to discover Beecher's works? Were they widely available? How did you know when you had found them all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, we both, I don't know when I discovered Beecher. I mean, I guess because we know about Harry Beecher Stowe so early, and I'm a bit of a, um, a fanatic about New England and religious history. So her father, Lyman Beecher, I was yes. aware of. Her brother, um, Henry Ward Beecher, I was aware of him. And um, her younger sister, her youngest sister, Isabella Hooker, Be Be Beecher Hooker, was a feminist who helped to compile the six volume series of the women's suffrage history that Susan B. Anthony, Seneca Elizabeth Falls. Cady Stanton, yes. right, from Seneca Falls on, mm -hmm. all the women's conventions through the 19th century. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I knew about her women's, her work about women and her work about slavery, and Teresa had first discovered her work about religion, um, her, her philosophy of religion. And, um, yeah, we found them by, as I worked more and more on the history of women in philosophy, I know you go to the library and you ask them for the OCLC information, you ask them for Library of Congress. At that point, we were just starting to use the internet for library searches. 
Um, and so I would go to the librarians and say, how do I find this? How do I find that? There were still paper indexes from 19th century periodicals. Oh, I remember I would, card catalogs. <laughs> yes, but, but, but Poole's Index, yes. which is a terrific book. Oh, another thing I did, this is like a, a, book, a book nerd's dream, right? There were these National Union catalogs of yes. every publication. They were about this big. And about every two hundred and sixty volumes. I oh, think. shelves and shelves yes, and shelves yes, of I them. Remember. And I would go to those, and it seemed like every volume I took out, there would be a layer of dust. <laughs> I would have to blow off the dust because nobody else was using them but me. Um, so I, that's how I, I, I am sure Teresa, Teresa did her end of that work on the religion writings. Mm -hmm. We might have sort of cross-checked each other's list to make sure we'd gotten everything we could find and uh, then you know, decided what order to put them in and who would write which, um, write about which, and we co-wrote the introduction. Mm -hmm. Is there an archival collection of Beecher's, um, of her writings, her, of her uh, correspondence, or is everything now published? Oh, I'm, letters haven't, as far as I know, letters haven't been published. Mm -hmm. There may be some, some there might be some notes and papers. Um, I'm, I haven't looked at the family, there are different family archives, mm -hmm. and um, I haven't tapped into that at this point. It, that could be a whole other treasure, treasure trove to discover. Treasure trove. Yeah. I'm sure Lyman Beecher has vol voluminous, unless, unless like um, Louisa May Alcott's mother requested that her correspondence all be burned when she died, and they abided by it. Ooh. I wish they hadn't, <laughs> but you know, some people did that. They say, just get rid of it all. I don't want any scrap of it remaining. So I don't know. That's something that's, mm -hmm. that's maybe project number three, mm -hmm. right? Well, before we close, um, do you have any advice for young students coming up, especially women? Uh, should they consider going into philosophy? I think people should do what they love and they will make it work. Yes. Um, I could end with that, but I'll say a little more. I think that right now, professional academic philosophy, you know, there's not a lot of movement. There's a lot of challenges for the humanities these days mm -hmm. to be established as worthwhile. Um, I think that the education you get from the human humanities is always valuable. Um, whether it's marketable is another question. Yes. So, so, um, one thing that I know people do is they pair up their interest. They do philosophy and, and that might be better at the undergraduate level because at the graduate level, purity is really important to yes. be honest. So um, I think they should, they should go for their passion if they want to and tap into networks of people who have interests like you because that will give you the ability to translate that into a living <laughs> Yes. <laughs> which we do need to earn our way, unfortunately, yes. as the, the St. Louis Hegelians actually would use the term, uh, philosophy can bake no bread, but it can bring us uh, life, freedom, and immortality. It's a quote from uh, um, one of the uh, idealist contemporaries, uh, a writer and poet. Um, and uh, they should, you know, find ways to tap into those networks and um, also find ways to keep their networks of support as they go forward. And good luck. Um, we'll be there waiting for you when you finish. Uh, yeah, so that's what I would say. Dr. Dorothy G. Rogers from Montclair State University, thank you so much for joining us today for Conversations with D. Otima. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay.